Hello and welcome to the book of Ephesians. We are in our growth book right now and this is a brand new book. It's another one of Paul's epistles. Um, this one was written during his third missionary journey. Um, it's accounting um, what took place in Ephesus um, somewhere around 52 to 55 AD and it is just chock load of so much, okay? Um, I was really, really impressed when I got into some of the background on the book of Ephesians, so hopefully I don't talk your ear off, but let's go ahead and pray and get started. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we just come before you right now, and Lord, I'm asking just for your articulation on the book of Ephesians and why it was written, why it is considered the church epistle, not just a letter to the Ephesians, but to all of the churches, to the body of Christ as a whole. Help us, Lord, to draw your truth out of it as we are in this season of studying it. We know it is not by accident, but by your divine preparation. God, you want us to know who you are. You want us to know your sovereignty and your power and your greatness, to be alert and aware to not just our natural surroundings, but the supernatural, the spiritual realm as well. So speak, Holy Spirit. You are the teacher. We are your students. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so the book of Ephesians. Like I said um, <laughs> during the prayer, um, this book is actually considered the church epistle, meaning a letter written to all the churches. Now, most people, when you bring up Ephesians, number one, um, they know the book of Ephesians. <laughs> but they also remember uh, the church of Ephesus. Um, that is actually called out in Revelations chapter 2. Now, they had a lot of strong points. They're probably the most, the, or the best talked about church in the book of Revelations out of the seven churches. But they had a little issue. They had an issue in that they had forgotten their first love. Um, and so there was this call back into that right place. Don't just do the right things, but do it with the right heart. Do it because you love me. Okay, um, and so the city of Ephesus is in, located in Asia Minor, and it was uh, just uh, it was the metro uh, me metropolis of the region, meaning it was the big bustling city. It was the place to live. It was like Los Angeles, California. Okay, and they had a lot of trade um, coming in and out, and with any major like port or trade region, you had a lot of customs and religions and belief systems um, coming in from other countries um, into this one place and it would, it would get concentrated there, okay? And then from that place, it would kind of spill out all over the world. And so it wasn't just goods that were being shipped through there. It was also religious beliefs and practices um, as well as um, philosophical ideas. Uh, and so the Church of Ephesus was that place. Um, there was a, a Roman writer that had called um, Ephesus the light of Asia. So it was very well known. It had amazing architecture and um, not always for, um, you know, uh, secular buildings, but they were most well known um, for their temples. And so um, one of the main temples in Ephesus was the Temple of Diana, okay? And so members of the cult of Artemis worshiped at this Temple of Diana, and it was considered at its time one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, and it was 418 by 239 feet big. <laughs> it had 127 columns, these grand columns, okay, around the outside of the structure, and each one of them was actually a gift from a different king in a different region. So this lets you know um, that people who came into this region, maybe they came to travel, to sightsee, they came for business, okay, or they came for work, but they began to now build a relationship and get connected um, with the religious teachings in the area. And so you have to imagine if there was 120 seven columns that's like um that were gifted by kings that means 127 countries that were now being influenced by the cult of artemis that were worshiping in a likeness to what people experienced in ephesus at the temple of diana and, and this was very profane okay it, it was um immoral it, it was witchcraft okay it, it, it was not uh, morally 
sound at all, okay? And so this is what's going on in Ephesus. Um, during Paul's second missionary journey, we know that he had passed through here. He wanted to minister here, but the Holy Spirit had stopped him. Okay, and the Holy Spirit redirected him out, but um, he had made contact with Apollos and he left two of his disciples there, Aquila and Priscilla. Now they began to now work with Apollos and they even discipled him. See, he was familiar with the baptism of John, but not the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So let's fast forward. Paul comes back on his third missionary journey and he comes with the power, with the fire of the Holy Spirit. Okay, um, he is doing um, deliverances and miracles. This is in Acts 19 verses 11 through 12. He's casting out demons. Okay, um, he is coming in the full demonstration of the spirit of power. And, and now the whole place is being shook. He is challenging. Okay, everything that is happening in that region from Jupiter worship to African fetish idol worship um, to now the manufacturing even of these silver idols and altars to all of these foreign gods, these Roman or Greek gods and, and um, to just blatant witchcraft, okay? So this region was well known for the production or manufacturing of these and the craftsmen were very upset with Paul because he basically started to shut down their business by now educating people through the power of the Holy Spirit, not just the doctrine of God's word, but a demonstration of who God is, okay? People now turned away from that, those false religions, and they started turning to God, okay? So this is an exciting time. Um, you see this all over um, the book of Acts, and I am very excited to get into this with you. Um, a little bit about Paul when he was there. Um, it said that um, there were these sweatbands while he was working in his aprons, that those were actually taken and they were laid on to sick people and they actually came, um, were well, made well, right? Also, this is the place, okay, where um, magic books and books on sorcery were brought out in, in like the heaps, like just mounds of books and set on fire, okay? So we're seeing a response of the people to true repentance. And primarily, I want to say, because of the education. Now, I want to point this out because we as a church follow a very similar model. See, Paul started this missionary school. So when most of people were sleeping, taking a siesta in the afternoon from 11 to 4, uh, Paul was teaching. And so he was at the lecture hall of Tyrannus and he would teach. And he had about uh, 30 of these students that, that he was discipling, um, discipling them on the power of the Holy Spirit, the operation of the Holy Spirit, and, and the truth of God's word and, and um, solid doctrine. Now, these students went out and they were actually the ones evangelizing all of Asia and they were starting churches. And we see this in Acts 19.10, okay? And so it was just a really powerful time for the church to be alive. But I love the model of utilizing disciples to grow the church <laughs> okay so let's get into the very beginning of Ephesians together I know that we could talk a lot about what was going on in Ephesus but let's now get into this specifically chapter 1 what God is saying to the church even today that we can learn from the church in Ephesus so it says here and beginning in uh, chapter 1 verse 1 this letter is from Paul chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. He says, I am writing to God's holy people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. Okay, right away, chosen by the will of God. Chosen by the will of God. Paul didn't self-appoint. He wasn't elected. In fact, most of the people really liked Apollos in the region. He was a very eloquent speaker. He was well-known. He had good relationships. Um, and so Paul wasn't trying to win a popularity contest. He wasn't doing something because the people wanted him to. He was doing God's will, God's way, and God's timing. Okay? So here we have this word um, chosen. Okay? Okay? And it, biblically, it means one who is the object of choice um, 
of divine favor or an elect person. And an elect person is a person that God has chosen and singled out for salvation and for his purpose to be fulfilled through them. We are the elect of God. We are the ones that God has chosen. And God is saying to each and every single one of us, I chose you, not just for your own personal salvation, but so that you would do my will, so that you would evangelize, so that you would save souls, so that you would tear down the kingdom of darkness, that you would confront the lies of this world with his truth so that you would be his witness. All right, I told you this is exciting. Um, you know, God chooses us specifically, okay? Um, and we know that in Romans 9, 11, and for specific plans. That's in Jeremiah 29, 11, all right? And so what, who or who is he calling? It says here, um, those in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Christ. So a faithful follower um, is convinced Jesus is the Messiah and author of salvation. They are convinced that, um, uh, that they are the person in whom faith or trust to share the gospel is resting in. So I know that that is in me. I carry it everywhere I go and I will operate in it by faith. All right, so let's keep going here. Um, there's so much to talk about the will of God. Um, the will of God isn't just um, this is what God says is going to happen, but it's also God willing in us. It's God desiring for us to do those things that he created or purposed for us to do. Okay, so it's as much as our response as it is his desire for us. All right, let's go into verses three through five. This is saying all praise to God. Again, I'm going to stop. All praise. What are you praising right now? What are you exalting? What are you in awe of? What do you think is, is supreme in your life? Because it should be God. God needs to be in the number one spot. And if we start to put other things, even people in that place, okay, we're in error. It says they're all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, okay? And then it says here in the heavenly realms, because we are united with Christ. So remember what I said earlier, we're not just here addressing the natural realm, but Paul is also reminding us that God is great in the spiritual realm. In fact, he's the greatest. No matter what, um, like he's telling the church in Ephesus, and we can say it today, say it to today's millennials and, and Gen Xers and Zers. You know what? You may have seen some demonic manifestations, some seances, or heard some incredible things through horoscopes and diviners. But the truth of the matter is, I don't care if it's a prophetic voice in a church or a demonic voice out there in the world. God is greater and powerful over all of those things. He reigns there and every spiritual blessing coming to your life is coming from him. Okay, so whether it's a counterfeit source or even an authentic source, realize that person who prayed for you. They're not the one that's responsible. Don't put your faith in them. Don't start to get caught up and I need to go back to them. Realize you need to stay submitted and grateful to God. All right. It says, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us. There it is again in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. Again, this doesn't happen apart from Jesus. So praise him, worship him, follow and obey him, okay? But I love here, it's talking about before and in advance. This is also the, um, the predestination doctrine, okay? Which means God created us with the intent that we would be with him for all of eternity, that we would know him and, and live with him in his perfection. He wanted an intimate relationship with us. He wanted us for eternity. Sin got in the way of that, but God never stopped wanting it. He said, this was my plan and intention from the beginning. I chose you. That's why I created you. So he's doing everything he can to make a way for you to be reconciled to him, to, to live with him for eternity in heaven. Now, we still have our choice to make. And if we choose not to um, accept that invitation to come back into this relationship with him and be a part of his family, the way that he enabled for us to be one with him, that's our choice, but it doesn't change his intention or will for us. He said, even if you don't want me, I've already chosen you. I just feel like God loves us so much, right? Verse six says, so we praise God again, right? It's just saying this, like, just keep praising him. Just keep thanking him. 
for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. Okay, once I come into this relationship with Jesus, I belong to Jesus, right? I've received him as my Lord and Savior. I have been grafted into the vine or adopted into the family, okay? Now it says here, because I am coming to, to the Lord, um, I'm approaching the throne through Christ Jesus or through my relationship with him. I can praise God because of this glorious grace that is poured on to me. Grace enables me to be able to live for God. It means where you're short, his grace is going to make a way. His grace is sufficient, like he told Paul. Okay, and then it says here in verse seven, he is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son. It's like, how good is God? He said, there's nothing that can atone for your sin, but the sacrifice of someone who couldn't sin or didn't sin. And only my son can accomplish that for you. And in his kindness, he went through that level of sacrifice for you. And then he forgave our sins. He wasn't begrudging at us that we had to do that. He didn't say, now earn your way back to me. Look at everything I had to do for you. God is kind. He's merciful. He extends grace to us. And it says, he has showered his kindness on us. I don't know about you, but when I get in the shower, I'm drenched, right? And it just covers every part. This is the kindness of God. He says, I'm going to cover every part of your life, okay? And then it says, along with, so he showered us with kindness, along with, so the gifts keep coming here, all wisdom and understanding. You know what? I am not always the smartest person in the room. And even if people think that I am sometimes, I'm not. God is the smartest person in the room. So don't ever lean on your own understanding, ability, or knowledge. You know, you may be tempted to do that, but I want to remind you, God is the smart and powerful one, and he says, I'm giving you my wisdom, so seek him for it. God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan, and this is the plan at the right time. Okay, when he wills it, when he knows it needs to happen, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ. There's a day coming, whether you choose him now or not, when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance. I'm like kindness, understanding, wisdom, and an inheritance. Yes, it is good to belong to the Lord, right? It says, we have received an inheritance from God for he chose us in advance and he makes everything work out together for his plan. So for all these people in Ephesus that thought they had to follow all these Gnostic religions, witchcraft religions and foreign gods to get um, their sins forgiven and covered or, or to uh, be successful or have a great afterlife. Paul's saying, throw all that out. All you need is Jesus. So remember, even today, take it to the basics. All you need is Jesus Christ. Verse 12 through 14, as we're coming to the end of this chapter, says, God's purpose was that we Jews who were the first to trust in Christ would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believe in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so that we would praise and glorify him. God has always wanted our praise. See, the spirit is a guarantee and advance, okay, on the spiritual oneness and inheritance, the wisdom, the authority, the power, the access to God that Jesus promised us through relationship with him. And so he put something already in us. He says, you don't have to wait till you get to heaven. You get to have it immediately. If you have not received your baptism in the Holy Spirit, I definitely encourage you today to take time to stop to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to fill you, okay? And he will lead you in a confirmation that everything God promised you is yours and you're going to have it, <laughs> okay? Um, let's finish it up here. I'm going to skip to verses 19 through 23. Um, I know that this is the very end of the chapter. It says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. So Jesus, once he died, descends into hell, defeats Satan, death, 
all right, takes back the keys to the kingdom, and then he ascends, right? And then he is seated back in a throne, a position at the right hand, the ultimate position, okay, of sovereignty over everything. And, and God is saying that power that did all that, that could defeat Satan, it's yours. It's in you. You have access to it. We need to understand that. We need to now begin to exercise that authority by trusting in God. It says in verse 21, Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else. You don't have to trust in anything else, church. God and his word are more than enough. Not only in this world, but also in the world to come. Remember, this was the guarantee. He said, I'm not just going to help you be successful in this world, um, happy, free, um, give you wisdom here. But for all of eternity, you have that promise. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church, for you, for your benefit. And the church is his body. We don't belong to ourselves. We belong to him. And we should be fulfilling his will, not our own, not, not the cultural standards around us, like maybe like Ephesus, and we see that a lot in today's society, but God's will, God's standard, God's way. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. So I encourage you today, church, dig deep into the book of Ephesus, see where you can apply his word to your life, where you can dismantle those lies that the enemy has tried to convince you of through pop culture, maybe even through some demonic practices. Maybe you have partaken in, in, in uh, minor occult things like Ouija boards and palm readings and tarot cards. And I, I just ask that you would repent of those things. You don't need to get your wisdom from anyone else or any other source only from Christ. Give yourself fully to him the way he gave himself fully to you. He is omnipresent. He is um, omnipotent, okay, which means all powerful, okay, and he wants to live inside of you. I hope you enjoyed today. Keep reading the book of Ephesians. Um, I look forward to um, next week when we cover chapter two. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this word. Continue to just break it down for us and let us understand the truth of how powerful and how awesome you are in everything you've given us. And let us utilize and not lay it dormant besides us, God. We don't need anything but you. And we thank you that you have given yourself fully to us. Amen.